How's it going? I'm Tina Edwards, and you're listening to My Year in Sound, a Sound of Life podcast powered by Keth. In each episode, we ask our special guests to put their year in music under the spotlight. We explore everything from iconic album releases through to unforgettable live shows, all kinds of music memories entwined with personal experiences and anecdotes. What's more, they'll bring in three personal items to help illustrate their special year in music. Bradley is the founder of Rhythm Section International, a record label, NTS radio show and club night host. Bradley's passion for club culture is second to none. He's part of the original Boiler Room team and today DJs across the world. His record bag is varied, covering everything from underground house treats to disco, indie and percussive sounds from far reaches. He's also co-founder of the much-loved London venue celebrating Caribbean culture, Jumbi and Moko. Bradley Zero, welcome to my year in sound. How's it going? It's going very well. Thank you for having me. Very excited to have you here. Uh, We're going to dive into your chosen year very soon. But first, we kind of just want to get to know you a little bit better. Um, You grew up in Leeds. What kind of music were you exposed to as a child? As a child, it was super, super varied because my my dad is, well, I say was. He just did his last ever DJ gig last year. I had no idea your dad was also a DJ. Yeah, so he's he's retired, a retired DJ. But um, growing up in the house, there was just tons of records everywhere. From early memories of um, Tainted Love by mm. um, Soft Cell. Yeah. That's one of the first songs I remember recording onto a Fisher-Price tape cassette recorder. Nice. Serious um, indie points there. Yeah, through, through to like a lot of reggae, jazz, mm-hmm. um, folk was quite a big sound in the house. I used to, um, well not used to, but I was exposed to a lot of Joni Mitchell, Simon and Garfunkel, those kind of sounds. And then I guess a big sort of influence coming from Leeds was dub music, mm. most importantly from uh, Sub Dub, which is Irish and Stepper's night in the Leeds West Indian Centre. So that was uh, the formative influences around the house, nice. in a nutshell. Super varied. So your dad, I guess a little bit like you, had a very broad spectrum of music tastes. Yeah, massively. He, I mean, he went to university in um, Newcastle in 69. Mm-hmm. So he was, you know, this is, if I could have chosen to be alive or even been at my prime, you know, at any period, it would probably be around then. But so he got a crazy... I guess, exposure to a lot of new music and new movements. Mm. This this was the beginning of the revolution. But then he was always like very diverse in his tastes. So the first electronic music record that I got into was Prodigy Experience. And that was through stealing a CD of his. Um, so yeah, everything from early rock and roll to super, I guess contemporary rave music at that time nice what was the first thing you remember getting really into was it like maybe one of the first records or cds you bought or maybe the first act where you're like oh my gosh i'm such a big fan for these guys well there's the answer there's the cool answer and there's the oh we want the real answer (laughs) (laughs) for me it was steps that was my big like i mean i'm I'm going in with the transparency it was steps for me (laughs) i definitely listen to steps on the radio yeah and i can't and won't deny that yeah but in terms of things that I felt that I discovered myself and really started to get into, I don't know, this idea of of finding things outside of the mainstream. Mm-hmm. It was that first Prodigy record experience, which is not an easy listen. And it's not no. really made for 11-year-olds, not or however all. old I was when I found it. Like super frenetic, non-stop, um, like relentless um, sort of onslaught of beats Mm -hmm. actually maybe it was made for 12 year olds (laughs) but (laughs) But um, this was like pre-club culture experiences for you i assume oh i'd never i was a i was a kid yeah yeah yeah. i think that album came out in 1991 i'm gonna say and i probably discovered it in 1997 or eight um but yeah then but 
a bit older than that or a bit later than that for me I was into a lot of bands I was playing mm. I was playing drums um I was playing in sort of metal y punky bands and I think Rage Against the Machine was a huge, huge formative influence. And I remember getting my hands on that record in school for the first time. I say record, it, it would have been an illegal download. <laughs> Sounds about right. LimeWire? Yeah. Lime, that might have been pre-LimeWire. That might be Napster, you know. Oh, OK. Way back when. Yeah. And uh, just having my mind blown. Because yeah. I'd grown up listening to a lot of funk um, and soul and, you know, things like Bill Withers and James Brown and then a lot of, I guess, more the, more of the mainstream alternative rock that you'd hear on the radio, whether it was Nirvana or Metallica. But then hearing those things kind of come together mm. with the hip-hop influence in this, like, super anti-establishment, just <sighs> sermons almost, was hugely inspiring. Mm. But they'd already split up by the time I got into them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you had kind of like a limited discography to dive into, I suppose, which can make it feel quite special in a way where it's like, I found this band, there's probably never going to be any more music than what I can actually see. Exactly. Kind of but there was quite a lot to go through. It was more a case of I'm never going to see them. Because mm. I started going to Leeds Festival when I was 13. Right. I don't know how I was allowed, <laughs> but I used to go on my own with my friends. Um, I think the first time was 2001. And... Yeah, I was I was just starting to understand the power of live music and mm. not being able to see Rage Against the Machine was um, it felt it felt like I was missing something, but I finally got to do it and it, it this was still to this day one of the most exciting musical days of my life, which is when we went to see them at um, Finsbury Park. I think it was two thousand ten when they got to Christmas number one. Yeah, I remember that happening. There was the big campaign, yeah. which was a sort of anti-pop idol, X Factor uh, campaign to to bring Rage to Christmas number one. And they said that if they did it, all their money went to um, various charities, I think mainly Shelter. And they also said they would do a free gig. Incredible. And we broke into it. <laughs> and it, it was... Get Incredible. On. Wow, I yeah. cannot imagine. I mean, so lots of people turn to you for your taste in music. Was it like that as well when you were a teenager or a child? Like, were people at school coming to you being like, Bradley, what are you listening to? Or did that come later on? Um, strangely, it did. But that's because my dad, also being a DJ, he had access to a CD burner. Oh, so I was one of the first kids in school to have a CD writer, which came with significant cultural cachet yes. you know? oh my gosh I can't imagine like you must have been putting together a lot of cool stuff to, like give to your friends or... yeah I was I was I was burning CDs and selling them um yeah and because I had a ISDN phone line at home mm -hmm. and a lot of CDs that my dad had collected over you know the course of his career um yeah I was the I was the go-to CDR dealer <laughs> <laughs> Every playground had one. Um, it was a different time. It was a different time. Um, so I wanted to ask you how you know that you have found something special as, you know, head of a label, as a DJ, um, as someone who revolves around music every day. What is that feeling that you get when you're like, ah, this is special? Well, feeling is the right word because it is just a feeling. And you, you can try to put it into words or to quantify it, but when it comes down to it, it it's just a feeling yeah mm. yeah i think you have to sort of disassociate your 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 gut reaction and your like logical um i guess response because some things don't necessarily make sense on paper yeah. some sounds don't sound like they work if you describe them or it might not be the most in vogue thing but you have to sort of trust your gut mm. and the gut's not, it's not always right, commercially speaking, but I think at least if you follow that, whether you call it your gut or your heart, whatever, your instinct, um, at least you're going to be sort of, it's going to be honest, an honest catalogue that you sort of build up because you, you believe in it, you yeah. know, rather than thinking, oh, um, breakbeats having a moment, we should really 
look for something like that and oh yeah tiktok is is trending on tiktok so we we need to get something that sounds a bit futuristic that that's i think you might get lucky and kind of get land on something that's very like in vogue for a second but i don't think those are the the a and r decisions that last mm. you know that that have a legacy so yeah i wish there was a bit more of um a formula because it would be easier but i think it really does come down to a feeling and and that feeling trumping any kind of genre or sound or style which i think has been an important i guess uh aspect or lack of aspect of uh, the label's history yeah and speaking of the label so that started in 2014 in peckham what was it that made peckham feel like the perfect place or maybe it wasn't even that premeditated was it just a, a thing that that was born whilst you're in Peckham because I, I feel like Peckham and rhythm section there's a real tight relationship between the two 100% yeah they're they're um intertwined and yeah it was not a decision to sort of go there I'd, I'd already been there at that point for seven or eight years and I moved to Peckham in 2008 but I actually started working in Peckham in 2007 before I moved down there right. um, and what were you doing in 2007 I was working in a bar okay nice yeah I was working in a bar and sort of discovered this whole community of creative people who were making their own fun because at that time Peckham was a different place I mean it's always evolving but I guess my Peckham was a different place. There's, like anywhere in London, there's there's layer upon layer of, I guess, perspectives and experiences of any given area in the city. You could have two people live on the same street who have a totally different vision and day-to-day experience of how they navigate around the city and the places they go and the people they see and the things they do. But um, that said, back then Peckham was sort of a lot more disconnected because it's not geographically very far from the centre but there was no overground until 2000 and I'm going to say 12 or 13 Mm. so even to get to like the other hot spots of kind of uh, young creative people doing artsy things like Dalston for example that was like two buses and a a train right it's a mission It it was a real mission but it created this sort of slightly dislocated um, satellite scene that was accessible, but it wasn't so easily accessible. So people, we created our own thing. It was a bit of a pressure cooker effect where because it was difficult to navigate around and go to these other hotspots, um, we evolved our own sort of quietly, quite tightly knit um, creative community down there. And just through working on that bar for for a number of years, I just, I felt part of something in a way that I'd never really had done before. You know, I'd grown up in Leeds, I never felt out of place. I never felt like I wasn't at home, but I didn't almost understand or didn't know that there was another level of like feeling part of a community. Mm -hmm. So it was only really when I moved to South East London that I felt this community and understood a deeper meaning of what it means and, and, yeah, what what it, what it brings to your life, and uh, yeah, it was a super exciting time. Um, those those early days for me in Peckham. That's cool, and it sounds like you know that that spirit of community that you found very much transferred into rhythm section. Because I think a lot of people refer to rhythm section as being a community and somewhere where they find like minded people on the dance floor or people with similar interests, tastes, wherever it may be. Um, I mean, perhaps that's the the crux of it, but I wanted to ask you why you think rhythm section means so much to so many people. Yeah, well, I think, like you said, it was born out of a genuine community of people who um, coalesced around this thing. But the, the time when the party started, which was 2011... It was, I, I kind of refer to those early days of doing the party and starting the label as like the golden, the golden era. Because mm-hmm. 
we were we were young, we were we were free. <laughs> you know, we had less responsibilities and less things to worry about. You take more risks, I guess. You take more risks because you've got nothing to lose. But yeah. it's also, and I only really noticed this having gone through the pandemic and emerged out at the other end. But I, I always thought of myself as one of the young ones, you know. Um, and certainly, a lot of the people that I looked up to when I started putting on events and running a label and DJing. They were a lot older than me, and obviously they still are. But it's only after the pandemic that I realised that I'm now that older generation, and and other people are look, looking up to me. And in, in well, at least I I hope they are. <laughs> I'm, they absolutely are, and it's funny how suddenly that can happen as well. It, it felt like a very quick shift, you know, that that I'd gone from one of the young ones to sort of approaching an elder. I'm obviously not an elder in the sense of like. You know your DJ Harveys and your Giles Petersons and your David Rodigans, mm-hmm. but I'm not a beginner anymore. No, you know? you've got wisdom to offer. You've got experience behind you. Yeah, but but to go back to the to the point I was trying to make as I get further and further off track. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome to dive to diverge wherever you want to go. <laughs> yeah, th- th- those early days. It was what I'm trying to say is that I was the average age of the 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 visitors you know i was the average age of the punters coming to the dance whereas and at what has been important and which is a good thing that that average age has stayed pretty much the same which means that we're i guess keeping relevant yeah. because you know as i approach my late 30s um there's no way that i could do a regular party and expect my friends to come every month because no. They've, they're all having kids. They're they're moving out of the city. They're settling down. It's a natural um, it's a natural progression, isn't it? Um, but I guess what I do is is very rooted in that like youth culture and youthful energy and you know celebration celebrating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those those early days was all of my friends were part of that you know, that, that movement and that they were that age and we were all out there together and it's days I look look back on very fondly. Yeah, I bet you do. And, you know, being such a a vessel, I suppose, with rhythm section for the things that you love and what you believe in, of course, you know, there's lots of people contributing to that. But I think when you are performing wherever it may be, let's say you're in Melbourne, you know, they kind of get a, a small taste of that rhythm section experience, perhaps. How do you get the most out of your touring experience because I think your schedule is quite intensive isn't it you can be in South America one month or Melbourne the next month or you know somewhere in Europe the next month it's quite an exhausting lifestyle like how do you um how do you manage it along everything that alongside everything it's a very good question I I still (laughs) feel like I'm I still feel like I'm figuring (laughs) it out in many ways but but for me it's not the the, the touring isn't something that I feel is draining in itself. I mean, there's there's little logistical things like getting over jet lag and mm. trying to get in the right time zone, but your body does get better at that, and I can kind of click back in pretty quick now. Nice. Um, but I, I get energised by, by going to a new place and meeting new people and playing in new places, discovering new cultures and new music and meeting new audiences. That, that tops me up. Mm. I think really the thing that I struggle to find the like work-life balance with is everything else in between you know it's all it's the admin it's all the meetings it's the running around town it's um emails Mm -hmm. you know like just the the unavoidable uh things that you have to keep on top of that's what kind of stresses me out in a in a weird way having to go on tour is a like the best excuse to sort of just switch off and Ignore those things for a minute. Yeah, just that's put you out of office on, that's and it. no one can really complain. Yeah, you just sort of can very much focus on being present and, a, and perhaps a bit more uh, mindful in a way because you're just there, and there's a reason for being offline. There's a exactly. reason for not getting back to stuff. It's like a holiday with a purpose, and yeah. and that purpose feeds back into everything that I do. But yeah, having having said that, I think. The more the more I think about it, when I'm away, for not if I'm just away for one night in Paris or Berlin or you name it, somewhere I can get back and forth, back and forth in a day. But if I'm actually away for like a week or two, 
I feel this is when I'm almost uh, at my best, you know. This is when, because I'm not trying to keep up. And I, and I think that's when you make the best connections. That's when you make the... That's when you make the chance encounters and meet interesting people and decide to say yes to an invitation that leads you to somewhere that you didn't expect and, you know, can open all sorts of doors and and um, opportunities. So, yeah, I think what I should sort of uh, try and manifest is living in that tour state of mind all the time mm. where I'm excited to be where I am and I've got time to say yes and see where things lead but um yeah i'm working on it cool that's a beautiful <laughs> mindset to work towards for the full time um and then back home you've got two venues which you co-founded jumbi and moco um both of them celebrate caribbean culture um very much like a, a one turntable kind of setup um these spaces have become so loved and appreciated it must be really rewarding to see how they've been so kind of accepted into people's everyday habits or you know whether it's going to Ori for example on a Tuesday uh, at Jumbi which is this wonderful collective or uh, Femi putting on Femi from um, as your collective putting on a few nights situation at, mm -hmm. at MoCo um, they've been really embraced that must be really rewarding as a DJ who before you know has been entering spaces to perform and, and leave but instead you've sort of been founding and creating a place and developing the energy that you want in those spaces it must be really beautiful to to grow and develop and watch it be so celebrated yeah it, re it really has and and it it kind of goes back to um what we were discussing about or what i was kind of um, rumbling on about my uh transition from sort of like bartender to promoter to sort of elder somewhat and i think like i like i was saying my time for my, me and all my uh, peers to be sort of using these spaces and out there all the time is is like it's not over but it's not it's coming to it's slowing down shall mm -hmm. we say so I think part of what I wanted to do with opening the venues was was to sort of I don't know step up and be rather than be the punter be the provider be the mm -hmm. The, the landlord be the I guess have that bricks and mortar space to allow other people to do their own thing nice um, because I owe so much to the, the venues and the bars and the clubs that I've worked in that I've done my thing in and that I was allowed to sort of experiment in and it's super rewarding to see that happening with the people that are working and part of the communities that that gather around Jumbi you know mm -hmm. um for example, one of our one of the bartenders, uh, Dom, who we I mean we hired all the people based on them just being interesting rather than particularly uh, experienced at working on a bar. And this 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 guy Dom, he actually grew up quite near me, just outside of Leeds. And since he started doing a, a sort of semi regular event on the Jumbi Terrace, he he did a takeover at Fabric. He went. He, he performed at Leeds Festival. He's been. He's got a radio show, and it, it's really taking off. And to see these things happen, to see Ori sort of become, an, the institution that it is now, and go on to do things at the Southbank Centre and playing on national TV in France, that's it's amazing. And um, yeah, it, there's a. The, I get a lot out of being able to uh, provide that platform. You know, mm. Bradley, tell us about the year that you have chosen. I chose the year 2014. Nice. So this is the founding year of the the rhythm section label. Yeah. The founding year of the label, but also the year that I stepped away from, I guess, my last ever job, which was working at Boiler Room. And that was also, I guess, kind of prime time for when we, when we were doing our parties twice a month at the pool hall in Peckham. So it was... Um, yeah, it was a, it was a big year, a big year of change, a big year of like taking huge risks and kind of hoping for the best, uh, a year of self sufficiency and uh, and yeah, a, a year that 
I guess, was the beginning of the next 10 years to follow. Cool. I mean, it takes so much courage to take that moment and go, right, this is where I'm going to get rid of the security blanket and I'm going to throw myself into that thing that I believe in. How did you know it was the right time? Well, you never really know, do you? You just have to, you just have to find out. Yeah. But it became quite clear that I didn't have enough time to do my own thing to a to a sort of high standard as well as help kind of nurture someone else's thing mm-hmm. um and the two two and a half years I was at Boiler Room were like two of the very best years of my life crazy experience wild opportunity um and we ended up in just some insane situations like that's a whole other podcast in itself <laughs> can you give us a teaser to that podcast Oh, yeah. I mean, it was one minute I was DJing in my bedroom or, or playing in a bar in Peckham for five pounds an hour. Right. And then next minute I was, I was, you know, in a crowd of DJ EZ um, or in the W Hotel with Disclosure and Scream or in Detroit with Richie Horton and Robert Hood. Mad. Um, introducing like heroes, meeting people that I just idolised and sort of studied, you know, and then... Also, given the, I guess, the average age of all the people involved, even the people in charge, we were just the blind leading the blind. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't really have a remit other than just put on some cool shows and book people who you want to see. Well, Boiler Room, I guess, was sort of the first channel of its kind. Like, you had session sites, like Balcony TV, I think, were one of the first. But I can't think what came first, but it definitely wasn't like a... A, a clear structure, you know, once you've got the idea there of, um, okay, great, we're going to have uh, DJs and going to play around the world. I don't think there was really anyone doing it before Boiler Room. Like, you guys were creating the structure, creating the the format. Yeah. I mean, th- there was a few people who did similar things, um, whether it was One Man or um, uh, Tim and Barry or there was, what else was there at that time? But it, it was a pretty simple idea, like in the, in the the most fundamental sense, just a camera on a wall mm. and someone playing music. But they made it into, I guess, a movement and, and a viable business. Yeah. And I think a lot of a lot of its success is really down to very savvy business kind of skills from Blaze, who's the founder, because uh, any, anyone could have copied it. And many people did copy it. It wasn't an idea that is really trademarkable. Right. It was, its success really comes down to, besides the programming and the vision and the artistic side of it, um, just just a very good plan for growth. Mm. And, and um, because that's what needs to happen. Something like that needs to keep growing, but you have to kind of balance that growth with like a sustainable like authenticity. And even though some people would say that at points it's gone too far and it, and it's easy to, you know, to uh, complain about these kind of things in YouTube comments and Instagram reels. But it really has um, balanced, you know, th- the business with the real underground authenticity in a way that no one else managed to do. Um, but at that very beginning, it, at the very beginning when, when I was on board, it was just... It was just a free for all, yeah. Just figuring it out as we go along. Figuring it out as we, as we went along, and and yeah, um, exciting times. Very much. All right, let's talk about one of the the items that you've brought in. What's the first one that you want to share with us? Um, let's start with the record, which is um, RS001, um, Aldosan Junior, Rylan Volume One, which was the first record we put out on. Rhythm Section International in 2014. Um, yeah, and here it is. And this takes us way back. How did you know that this was going to be the first release? Um, well, I didn't really have a plan for a second release. It oh, was, bad news. Okay. No, it, there was just one record that I wanted to put out because I had loads of music from this producer. And, and when I realised that it was otherwise going to just get left... And, and not see the light of day mm-hmm. um, I just decided that something had to be done and 
this record was born, but there wasn't a plan. There wasn't, I didn't have a plan for that year. I didn't have a plan for the second or third or fourth record. It was just, let's get this out. And then um, with some of the money that we made from the door of the parties, we uh, got about a thousand pounds together to do the pressing and then put it out into the world. Great. And I, something I've read actually in a couple of your interviews is that there was never a long-term plan for them section. It was very much just like, be here in the now, do what feels good now, see what comes next. So it seems like that was very much the case from completely the off. Um, and I assume off the back of the success of the record, it was kind of exciting to think like, great, we can do a second, we can do a third. And just sort of to see it build from there must have been very cool. Um, could you feel something was building at the time? Or were you too in it in the moment? No, definitely. Um... I think the reception of the first record was like blew me away. I, I remember hearing Giles Peterson play it on um, Radio Six, or would it have been Radio One at the time? Either way, on BBC, mm -hmm. and just the buzz from that and the sense of recognition, and hearing someone that that you sort of revere so much, giving you a name check and playing the thing that you put out there was like, you know, I got tingles. So. Yeah, I think as as you as you start to get these uh, nods of um, appreciation and respect from people that you that you look up to, then you know you you, you kind of get the feeling that you're doing something right. Yeah. And when people start to write about it, and then people start to play it, and you hear it in clubs, or you hear it in cafes, or on the radio, you see it in record shops where you go to buy other records. It's it it became visibly clear that the movement was growing, and that was sort of the the whole intention with the record label, which which I called Rhythm Section International, which is obviously quite at, at odds with the very localised vision of Rhythm Section, the the dance, mm. which was in one place, in one neighbourhood, on one in one club, um, twice a month. So I really wanted to take that essence and kind of explode it out into the world. Cool. And that it did. And in terms of, like, the... The, the music that you were releasing as well. I mean, very oriented in club culture at the start and then kind of veering off into a lot of live stuff um, as well with like Val's trio, Release of Joy. Um, it's a really great sort of spectrum of music that you guys put out. Was that something that you always wanted to do to expand outside of club culture and and sort of just, again, I guess, play, uh, release music that gave you a feeling or did you start off thinking like, okay, this is going to be like a club culture label i assume i assume probably more the the first yeah de definitely and i mean this record isn't really very clubby there's no. maybe a couple of things if you were a very daring dj that you can kind of work into a a peak time club set but it's essentially like a a beats record it's it's a instrumental hip-hop record at the core mm -hmm. the, this could be i mean i've i've i've, I've referred to al dobson as the uh as London's answer to Jay Diller and numerous times and that's the kind of the vibe if you haven't heard it before if you're into Jay Diller Madlib that kind of thing this is for you um, but as much as I, I guess I approach the label more in the way that I would approach a radio show because my my radio shows will take in everything from sort of ambient electronics to to you name it baseline like really quite a broad spectrum of things with everything from you know instrumental instrumental music through to rap hip hop jazz soul house techno you name it so that was more the approach of the label i think when you're djing you have a bit more of a duty to to move people mm. and there's different ways to do that um but my approach as a as a DJ is uh I guess more indebted to like house music. Um at least in a peak time kind of approach. Sure. Um and I guess that's also evolved as I've I guess got to play in more peak time slots. Because certainly when I was opening up rhythm section as a resident for like the first seven years, I wasn't I wasn't banging it out at ten PM in the pool hall. Yeah, yeah. It was a much more like slow and steady, varied, eclectic approach. But um, that's less what I do now and it's more of the peak time kind of thing, which I also really enjoy, but that doesn't reflect the label. So, yeah, 
to answer your question <laughs> after kind of going around the houses, um, yeah, it's absolutely not a club label, um, but we've released lots of club music and we've released lots of music to fall asleep to and lots of music to wake up to and lots of music for a Sunday afternoon, lots of music for a Saturday night. It's um, it's a spectrum and, and it's nice to, to be able to take that whole spectrum in. Tell us about your second item that you've brought in for us. The second item is a membership card from Canavan's Peck and Pool Club, um, which is, to anyone who, who doesn't know, is, is the spot where we did the party at the beginning for the first seven or eight years. And it was one of these places that was accidentally perfect. <laughs> it wasn't a club. It wasn't meant to be a club. It was never intended to be a club. Um, but I walked past there one day in the autumn of 2011 and there was a sign saying have your party here and I assume it was for like birthday parties or stag do's or something like that and I thought you know what I'm going to go in and ask him if I can have my party there and I was the first person to do that and then over the next few years it sort of became this this accidental institution and people were coming from all over town people were talking about it all over the world. I'd go to Melbourne and people would be telling me about canavans. I went wow. to Japan and people are, are like in, in broken English. That's mad. Asking but... me about canavans. <laughs> and and they, like... they know about the party on the other side of the world. And it's like, it's quite, it's not a huge spot either, is it? Not at it's all. Like... It's, you can fit more people than, or you could fit more people than it looked like. Mm -hmm. um, but when I say accidentally brilliant, in terms of the acoustics, it had sort of polystyrene ceiling tiles, the kind of thing you'd see in a in an office block, um, carpeted floors mm -hmm. and wooden panelled walls and an awkward um, sort of un... Uh, just like an, an awkwardly shaped um, layout. So it sounded really good. A lot of absorbent it, materials. So, yeah, yeah. It, this, the space was really dead and felt really sounded really nice with without having to put a huge sound system in um it had this sort of feeling that it was like a bit wrong like was it was it illegal was it it, it just felt a bit wrong which kind of adds to the mystique when you go into a space that feels like it's been repurposed um and and yeah it was just right in the in the middle of that kind of where that cultural moment was happening on Rye Lane. Uh, same name as the record, the same street as the bar that I worked on. Um, and it just hit the ground running from the first party. There was a queue outside around the corner and there was pretty much every every couple of weeks until we stopped doing it. Um, and yeah, this is, this is the, the membership card which you needed to get in because it wasn't actually a fully legal licensed venue. They had to run it as a members club. Right, okay. But you got free membership on the door. <laughs> Easy. <laughs> um, and then if you got there before midnight, you paid £3 to get in. And and yeah, that that's where I sort of honed my craft. Um, and those are the golden days that I was talking about earlier. Beautiful. And your third item, you are unable to find it but we've got it metaphorically talk us through it yeah and i can send you a picture of it i definitely have it somewhere <laughs> it exists it does exist and it, it's it's a sort of memento from the boiler room years um we couldn't think of the word that you would actually use to describe it but it's it's like a microphone holder a little square sort of cylindrical thing that goes around a microphone with the Boiler Room logo on. Mm -hmm. And that's what we would use when we were broadcasting, when when I was introducing, you know, all the DJs that came and played. Um, and, yeah, that, that just brings back some very fond memories of, of those years. And I guess another element of the thing that I do, which is broadcasting, and for, for a long time people would just sort of see me as the boiler room guy mm -hmm. and to the point that got quite frustrating like I'd be at a festival like DJing or just walking down the street in a foreign country and someone would shout oi boiler room 
<laughs> hey, new nickname. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's, not, it's nice to be recognised, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> I didn't feel that that was my thing, you know? Right, right. And uh, as much as they probably, uh, you know, enjoyed watching the boiler room thing, it was... Uh, it's nicer to be known for something that you've done. Mm -hmm. um, but regardless of that, it was an amazing time. And, and I say I was, I, I was part of it. Not, not to say I, I didn't do it, it wasn't my idea. Um, but we were definitely instrumental in sort of making it this vital thing that, that just continues to grow. That's very cool. And in, in terms of who you are today in 2024, and 2014, how do you think you've grown creatively in that 10 year space? Hmm. Um, are you the same Bradley today? That I you think I'm exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm a, a, a good mix of like um, sort of careful and risk taking, mm -hmm. you know? I think a lot of the things I've done have been very like slow and steady. It's always. So the, Obviously, you make, you have to make a big step every now and again and a bit of a leap into the void. But I like I like things to sort of find their own pace and to be able to evolve organically. And, and it feels like that's how all the things I've done have sort of evolved. Even the big steps like opening Jumbi, um, opening Moko, which was a huge step forward, but they kind of felt like... Um, just a logical step, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've definitely got way more responsibilities. I've got way more... Um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but I think I'm the same person. That's cool. Well, yeah, I'm the same person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Bradley Zero, it's been lovely to have you on my ear in sound. Thank you for taking us through your 2014 and your uh, journey with Rhythm Section International and with Boiler Room. It's been so great to kind of relive it with you and, and find out about this perfect, beautiful year that you had. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. pleasure.